Yes. All right. <laughs> well, welcome everyone to the first of this year's Burlington House Lunchtime Scientist Talks. My name is Lucinda, the one who's still trying to figure out technology, <laughs> and I work at the Royal Astronomical Society, which encourages the study of astronomy, solar system science, geophysics, and other closely related branches of science. Yeah, hello everyone, and my name is Joe. I work at the Linnaean Society, which aims to inform, involve, and inspire people about nature and its significance um, through our special collections that we have in our building in Burlington House, as well as our programs and scientific publications. Good thing we can edit video these days, so I'm really <laughs> looking forward to editing some of that out. But um, this is a really cool collaboration between the Royal Astronomical Society and the Linnaean Society, which we both live in Burlington House, which is this great big building in the center of London, in this really exciting space called Piccadilly. And as you can tell, um, I'm from California, so it's a wonderful place. Uh, to work and experience as someone who didn't grow up here in the UK. Um, but we're alongside other cultural organizations such as the Royal Academy of Art, the Royal Society of Chemistry, the Geological Society, and the Society of Antiquaries. And the Linnaean Society and the RAS have co-produced the series for young people, GCC A-level. I know we've got other members of the public with us today, and that's okay too. Hopefully you can contribute to some of this, especially if you're scientists. Um, but for people who have an interest in astrobiology to learn about this exciting field and the variety of careers that people can have. I'd just like to do a little bit of housekeeping, if that's okay. This webinar is taking place live. Um, some of you are on Zoom in a webinar and you can register for our future webinars by looking at our websites. But we're also streaming onto YouTube. So you might be watching on YouTube or perhaps on a different social media platform um, like Twitter or Facebook. If you are watching this live, hey, hi, uh, you can type questions or comments into the Q&A boxes or the chat boxes, and we will have a look out for those. Um, and we can bring those up to our speaker to try and answer them at the end or throughout, if that makes sense. Our speaker today is Professor Karen Olson Francis, and we're really excited to have her. Uh, Karen is a microbiologist by training, and her focus um, of research is about life at the limits. And she's interested in microorganisms that live in extreme environments here on Earth, as well as in, at the International Space Station. Her work with environments on Earth helps our understanding of extraterrestrial locations. Her talk is, what is astrobiology? A very broad um, title there. So thank you very much for joining us, Karen, and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you for inviting me here today to talk about astrobiology. So, um, as everyone said, my name is Karen Olson Francis. I'm a professor of actually geomicrobiology at the Open University in Milton Keynes. Um, I think I was asked to give this talk because I'm also director of Astrobiology OU, which is a multidisciplinary research group with over 50 um, members at the Open University that recently um, was awarded just under seven million pounds. So we're kind of quite a big group within the UK. Um, internationally, I'm also the UK representative on um, the Cosbauer um, Planetary Protection Panel, which is something that I will mention later on as well. Okay then, shall we get started with, I suppose, the big question, what is astrobiology? Let me just share my screen. Okay, so are we alone in the universe is one of the most fundamental questions of our time and is the driving force behind the emerging field of astrobiology. For thousands of years, humans have gazed up into the skies and wondered about the presence of life beyond the earth. Philosophers and scientists have pondered and argued, not just about life elsewhere, but about origins of life and evolutionally on earth. And now if we fast forward to present day, with access to space becoming more accessible an increasing number of missions is evolving, our understanding of the universe is evolving and so is the field of astrobiology. So astrobiology is a relatively new discipline. 
it is truly interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary, um, if you'd like to call it. You can't study it at school, but it does bring together some of the traditional disciplines you will be learning. Biology, physics, geology, maths, chemistry, all these subjects are needed to a part of astrobiology. The prime aim of the field is to further our understanding of the origins and evolution of life, not just on Earth, but elsewhere. It covers a range of diverse topics from the origins of life, um, searching for habitable environments elsewhere in the solar system and beyond, detecting life, what molecules or biosignatures can we use to define evidence of life elsewhere, it's also about prebiotic chemistry. So what about where the precursors for life exist? And as I mentioned at the beginning, planetary protection also fits within here. This is something that you may think, you know, planetary protection sounds something like a superhero would do. I'm definitely not one of those, but it's important because it means that we need to protect planets that we go and visit. So to make sure that contamination from Earth does not contaminate these other planets. And also, when we're thinking about sample return missions, it's also really important to make sure that we don't contaminate our own planet with terrestrial life. And over the coming weeks, throughout this series of talks that have been organised, you will hear about experts within each of these fields, and these will be some of the topics that will be covered. So, with no um, unambiguous evidence of life um, has yet been found elsewhere in the solar system or beyond, we do know that the chemical building blocks for life have been detected in a wide range of extraterrestrial environments. Meteorites have been found that contain organic um, amino acids and sugars. Both of these comments are the building blocks for proteins, which are the biological molecules that give structure and functions to cells. On early Earth, here's kind of an autistic vision of what early Earth could have looked like. It's thought that the first, um, and on early Earth, um, it's thought that um, organic molecules were produced um, to produce the building block of life. Some of you may have studied the Miller-Urey experiment um, as part of your studies. This was kind of developed in the 1950s, where Stanley Muller and Harold Urey um, demonstrated that some of these key building blocks could actually be simulated under an early Earth condition. There is, however, a large leap between organic building blocks and life on early Earth. And we have no solid evidence to show how life actually originated. What we do know though, is single cell microorganisms are thought to have been the first form of life on earth. Evidence consists of their, um, we, we, we can find evidence of their existence in rocks, which are about 3.7 billion years old today. And nowadays we know that microbes basically live everywhere. There's predicted to be 5 million trillion trillion microbes cells currently on Earth. And this image here that you can see in front of you is actually um, taken by a scanning electron microscope, which is a really powerful microscope. Um, and each like these purple, these pink cells are about 20 microns long. And this is actually the microbes that grow on the have been isolated from a mobile phone. So, you know, microbes are everywhere in everyday life. And when we think about potential life beyond the Earth, as scientists, we kind of think life would look a bit more like this rather than the green alien-like forms that we hear about in sci-fi movies. And as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm a microbiologist by background. So when you ask anyone who works in astrobiology what astrobiology is, to each of them, depending on their background, depends on the answer they'll give. So for me personally, I'm interested in astrobiology from the idea of understanding how microbes can live and adapt to extreme environments and if habitable environments can exist elsewhere in the solar system. I'm particularly interested in microbes that live in really extreme environments. These are kind of like the superheroes of the microbial world. They can live in some of the most extreme environments. For example, we have organisms called hyperthermophiles, which can live at temperatures up to 122 degrees. And these can be found in kind of geothermic environments. We have microbes that can live and survive in really cold environments. For example, if we looked at microbes in the bottom of your freezer, it wouldn't surprise me if we would find some evidence there as well. They can also survive at high pH and low pH. So 
example, really acidic environments such as vinegar wouldn't surprise me if you could find microbes in environments that have a similar pH to that. And we also find microbes at the bottom of the ocean. And what we do is draw on this information that we know about life on Earth to, to, to further our ability to find evidence elsewhere. So looking at this information, what we know is that the mic that life in general needs three basic ingredients. We know it needs liquid water, which is essential for cellular processes because um, it's involved in a number of biochemical processes. It's also involved in um, removing waste and byproducts in the cell. Cells also need these key ingredients, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. The sulfur and nitrogen are needed for some key amino acids. Phosphate is needed for lipids and also is a key part of the ATP molecule, which is the kind of currency of the cell. And the carbon and the, um, and the oxygen are needed to build organic material. And kind of the final ingredient that we need is an energy source that will allow biochemical cycle um, processes to occur. Now, as humans, every time you eat food or you breathe in oxygen, you respire, you produce energy which can, you can use, your body uses. But microorganisms can use more than just organics and oxygen for, for, for energy. Um, they can use inorganic compounds to produce energy, such as iron and sulfate. And on Earth, we also have um, plants which produce energy through photosynthesis from energy from the sun. OK, so I've kind of given you a basic biology 101 there about life and, and, and the key building blocks. But how can this inform us about what lives beyond the Earth? Well, one of the major concepts for missions is a follow the water strategy. And this is something that's been, been used for, for years and it's still the key driving force for exploration when we're looking for evidence of life. Planets that have liquid water are found in the habitable zone. So there's Earth. Um, we have, um, and this is kind of also called the, the Goldilocks zone. So it's conditions which is not, you know, it's not too cold, it's not too hot, it's just fine to have liquid water. Um, obviously, Mars does not have liquid water on, but we know from robotic um, missions that um, there is evidence of past water on Mars and potentially in the subsurface of Mars as well. But also beyond the habitable zone, we um, are aware of icy moons, for example, of that of Jupiter and Saturn. You can see here in the top right corner. And what we know from uh, evidence from um, recent missions is that they have this thick layer of ice and underneath that there's kind of an ocean of water um, which is protected from the detrimental conditions of space. And potentially within these environments, um, they could have these key building blocks that we need for life. Um, and predictions based on the chemistry and the observations that we've had from, thing, from, from different missions suggest that these conditions would be conducive to life to exist. Okay, I'm not going to focus too much on the icy moons because I only have 20 minutes here. But what I want to do is talk to you more about Mars. And the reason I've chosen Mars for this is because we know a lot more about it. We've had numerous missions to Mars over the last um, 50 to 60 years. And this has been through a combination of flybys and rovers, which have given us more information about the geology of the planet and about the atmosphere. And this is really important so we can start looking at if we want to think about habitability and if life could actually exist. So originally, um, back in the 70s, um, the Viking mission, their main aim was to characterise the structure, um, to look at the, the, the surface, and they find evidence that there could have been liquid water on the surface. And Mars is a really exciting time at the moment because we've recently got um, a new mission there. You know, we have a number of kind of ongoing missions there, but recently we, back in February, had um, Mars 22, which is, this is a picture of the Perseverance rover, land on Mars. And what's really exciting about this um, from a scientific perspective is, yes, we have this rover that has lots of instrumentation on it, which can characterize different aspects of the geology and look for potential biosignatures. But what is really interesting about this is that it's going to catch these samples from the moons up from the surface. So it will identify area of interest, scoop um, 
parts of it up, put them into these kind of um, tubes and leave them on the surface of Mars. And the idea is that um, later on, what's going to happen is in a few years time, we'll send a mission back to Mars with a fetch rover that will collect those samples and then bring them back to Earth to analyze. Okay, so what we, the, all these missions has given us a really strong evidence of, of the conditions on Mars. So today we know that Mars is a cold desert environment, but 40 billion years ago, environments where it could exist. So life did evolve on early Mars like it did on Earth. Um, we could potentially find evidence of that on the surface of Mars, or we could potentially find it in the subsurface where it is protected by the detrimental conditions. But I think it's really important to think about this though, is you know, we need a lot of evidence to say that there's life on Mars. Um, and we need to be really strong about our beliefs. So um, I'm, some of you may remember a few years ago, there was this um, report from NASA that we have methane in, on the atmosphere of Mars, which is true, you know, that there, there is a debate that methane is available in the atmosphere on the surface of Mars. On Earth, methane is predominantly produced by life, by biotic processes. Um, for example, the picture here of the cow is that we know that microbes live within the cow gut and produce methane. Um, so what we need to do is, you know, although we know that this could happen, <clears throat> it can also be produced by abiotic processes. And what we need to make sure is when we make, when we hypothesize that life does exist on Mars, we need to make sure we have strong evidence with a number of different threads. And for what this we need, we need to have ambiguous, um, we need to have strong evidence of biosignatures. So this is kind of evidence of life. And there's a number of biosignatures that we could use. So if you think about life on earth, you know, prime examples that you'll think about are potentially stromatolites. And these are structural formations which microbes live in and they cement rock and sand materials together and you can visualize them in shallow water. Biomineralization is another example. So some organisms produce kind of hard structures to protect themselves in the environment. So shells, again, is, is an example of that. Um, and what we do when we go to Mars is that we look for biosignatures using the techniques that we can on the rovers. I'm not saying we're going to have large biomineralization and um, large structures on Mars. What we're probably more looking like is evidence of microbial activity in the record, in the, in the rock record. This could be something like the microbes changing the local environment through growing and hence causing a change in the geology of, of the rock sample. Another example is looking at patterns of organics, um, which I'm using instruments like Raman and FJR. We can start to look at detecting if organics could exist, on, uh, can be detected. Now, if we want to look at organics on Mars, we really kind of need to get below the subsurface because organics are generally destroyed by the high radiation levels of the surface. So missions are really expensive. Um, they cost millions and millions of pounds. We can't go there all the time. So what we do as astrobiologists, we use a combination of techniques that we can use on Earth, which means that we can carry out controlled environments and use that information to feed into um, feed into our understanding and interpreting the stasis for Mars. So here's a picture of me up on the left and um, standing in a salt pool in Ethiopia collecting samples. Um, and this is an example where it's an analog site. So this is a really salty environment and potentially we think about highly saline environments could have existed within the transition of Mars from earlier to, to present day Mars and where life potentially could exist. We also have Mars uh, environmental simulation chambers, um, and we combine all this um, by to look to combine all this to get an understanding of biosignatures and life and modeling for space missions. So, prime examples of this is um, the modeling. So, what we do, this is something that we do in my group, is we take information from, from the, the rovers or, or the data that we get from Mars. Here's a picture of the MSL rover. And we take that information of the geology um, of the composition of the rocks. And what we can do is 
model the potential water composition that would have existed based on the chemistry. And this is something that my colleagues do. And from that, what we can do is kind of predict the composition of the water on Mars. And from that, we can then grow microbes um, to determine if microbial life could exist in there. We also use analog sites. So this is um, a picture. One of them is Mars and one of them isn't on, is on Earth. And it'd be interesting to see if you can tell which is which. But what we do, um, the one on the right is actually Earth. And what we do is that we use kind of environments on Earth, which are geologically similar to that, that would have a potential habitable environment we're trying to study to start to understand. So in this picture here, they're doing um, analysis, they're doing a um, technical um, sam a technical test where they're looking at if the technologies that they're developed to take to, to Mars in this instant could actually work. So they're kind of doing like a mission control. But as a microbiologist and environmental scientist, I'm more interested in the actual environment. So what microbes could live in those areas, what um, biosignatures could be juiced in those areas, and start to get an understanding from taking that information to understanding what we, we know. So a prime example of that is some work that um, members of my team have done is looking at the Arctic environment. So the Arctic is a polar desert, which is a, has a continuous permafrost on it. And this kind of simulates some of the conditions that we may have had um, associated with Mars. And the water is really sulfur rich there. Again, something based on the modeling we predict in regions of Mars could, could have existed. And what we can do from that is um, build hypotheses about what life could have potentially have existed on early Mars and what biosignatures it could have to, to, to live in, it could produce. So for example, the work we did on here demonstrated using molecular techniques that the commun microbial community in these environments is dominated by microorganisms that use sulfur. So remember I mentioned back at the beginning about how we use organics from food and oxygen. Microbes that live in these environments depend on sulfur for, for growth and metabolism. So we predicted based on that, you know, the kind of, we can then predict the kind of biosignatures and impact they'd have and how we could detect them. So that's kind of an example of some of the analog work we can do. But analog work, you know, in nature we know is not consistent. There's lots of heterogeneity around that. So what we do in parallel is we can use lab simulations experiments. Now this lets us fine tune the conditions that we want to study. Um, and it also allows us to, to um, study different parameters, which we would not generally be able to, um, we wouldn't generally be able to, to monitor in, in the environment. So here's some examples of small simulation chambers that we have at the Open University. And within them, we can simulate different conditions. We've got low pressure, temperature, radiation. And it allows us to look at microbial survival and biosignature um, detection in these chambers. So seeing if any of the biosignatures that we have would break down in these conditions. And we can use this information to refer back to the mission data as well. I've been lucky enough as well over the last, throughout my career, to, to not just do work in the lab simulation experiments, I've also been involved in experiments in low earth orbit. So I've had experiments, been involved in big experiments um, on the International Space Station, which we've had experiments on the outside of the space station, looking at seeing if microbes can survive and biosignatures and what impact that would have. I've also been involved in a project with basically um, had a big, ball being um, orbited around Earth and then came smacking back on Earth to look at the impact of um, low Earth orbit and impact on, on microbial communities as well. Um, this, you know, you would think that this is quite novel, but I think there's something over a thousand microbial species that have been in space over the last um, 40 years or so. So there's a lot of work going on there because what we can't do on Earth, which we can only do in low Earth orbit is, oh, is um, is simulate um, is is to look at radiation, which is something we have difficulty simulating on Earth. So in each of these little containers, you can see on the bottom right have little um, little containers which contain environmental samples or microbial samples. Um, I actually, as part of my work, 
took a part of a cliff um, in um, from Devon, a place called Beer, and sent it into space to look if any of the microbes could survive. So this is a lot of ongoing work that we do with East at, at the moment as well. OK, so this is kind of the wrap up of astrobiology, and I think the main point I want to show to you is that astrobiology at this moment in time is a really interesting and exciting area to be in. We've got so many missions coming up to Mars, Mars sample return, to, to um, the icy moons. We've not even mentioned exoplanets. But now is a really exciting time to be involved in this field. And I think this is, you know, and I think over the next century or so, I think we can all play a key part in, in answering this question, are we alone in the universe? Um, and as I mentioned, I think, you know, astrobiology is a really, really diverse topic. And I think one of the key points I want to put across here is that at school, you don't study, you can't do uh, A level or, or a GCSE in astrobiology, but each part of the work that you do, you know, in sciences contributes to that overall need with, within astrobiology. So I found this diagram, which I thought, which was really interesting. And it kind of showed if anyone is actually interested in astrobiology, I hope I have kind of made you think about it um, a bit, is that how to become an astrobiologist really. And I think at a teenage stage, the idea is, you know, to read about it, listen to podcasts, come to seminars like this. I mean, I have to admit when I was a teenager, I actually didn't want to become an astrobiologist. I wanted to study dolphins. So if you are interested, learn more about it. Um, and because at university level, there's not, there's nowhere in the UK that actually does a degree in astrobiology as such. So what normally happens is that someone would do a degree in different aspects of astrobiology, you know, different aspects. So you could do a chemistry degree, biology degree, and then build your area of expertise and then go into astrobiology. So kind of get your core area of where you want to go and then study astrobiology. But even if you are not a scientist, but are still interested in the whole concept of life elsewhere and, and where we go from there, um, I have a, in my group, I have a number of social scientists involved in, in the team. Um, so for example, there's a picture up on the right here of me. We, in our extreme environment analog sites, we've been doing a lot of work with indigenous communities and about teaching them about STEM using astrobiology um, and their natural environment. Um, we also, you know, there's lots of questions that we can ask about um, the governance of space, you know, who has the right to go to space. And as, as we open up to more individuals going, having the capability, you've got blue marble, et cetera, et cetera, going into space, we need to start asking those kind of questions. So I think over the next 10 years or so, the social scientists are going to be becoming more involved in this whole area as well. Um, and if anyone is interested, and I don't know, Joe, if you want me to do this now, but I did do a little diagram showing my career path, if anyone is interested, or we can leave that till later. Joe, I will take your advice on that. Hello, that was so fantastic. Thank you so much for... Um doing that uh, I think we've, we've definitely got uh, we can talk about your career path and maybe that video that popped up there <laughs> as well yeah, um, the video now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, so yeah thank you so much and it's it's great to see the breadth of what astrobiology uh, can mean to different people and what it means to you as well um, sh we'll have a look at the Q&A box and I will pick a nice question from there so while you do that Joe shall I just say my career path probably isn't what you think. Um, I grew up in a rural village in North Wales. Um, my parents didn't go to university. Um, I didn't get the A-levels I wanted. I went through clearing. Um, at university, I was diagnosed as being dyslexic. Um, I didn't do the traditional trajectory. I took a year out, went traveling, ended up doing a PhD in New Zealand. Um, and didn't want to do astrobiology straight away. I mean, my interest in astrobiology extreme environments happened in New Zealand. But my first postdoc was looking at stopping cows producing methane, basically, stopping them <laughs> farting. So yeah, it, it, you think there's no link between Mars and cows, but there's a huge link in the microbiology. And then, you know, I, again, didn't make a career. I took another year out. I've done a lot of traveling. And I think, you know, there's no 
don't always rush to where you go I think it's the message and I've had a couple of children and um I think me the caring point was having a, a fellowship and then getting this big grant and you know within the space of three years I've gone from a lecturer to a professor and it was quite worrying for me when I googled a professor online and found they were all grey-haired white male professors so I just wanted to put that up there and going you know what you can do whatever you want you know and I think if you interested in astrobiology you don't have to you know there's no straight career path to do that and I think that's something I hope you guys can take away from this. Yeah, absolutely. I would say that in, in my experience with astrobiology, um, I was interested in astrogeology as a young student and the people who mentored me were all astronomers also interested in astrobiology only because they were interested in exploring space further beyond earth. Um, and that's kind of what, uh, kind of put it on were you going to share that video on, on astrobiology i i wasn't going it, it's up to you but I, i'll just make the background apparently this is a lego version of me just putting <laughs> that out there and um, so we have a video which i will um i i haven't put the link in here but we have a video that we've made about a three minute lego video about astrobiology and what it is um i think i've um i've got the link here if you want me to play it i I could, or we could um, let people look at it at a later date. Or should we see how the questions go and we can go from there? Would that be easier? I think it's a good end video. Yeah, um, I agree with Joe. So let's go through the questions just so we don't um, get in as many as we can and don't miss oh, any. Because, yeah, they are um, adding up here. I, I think we have, like, um, a good deal five in here. And then uh, we can check our YouTube how that's going as well. Uh, Joe, did you want to start it off? Yeah, I was looking uh, at a couple here from Jade and Elif, and they were talking about careers, I guess, and access into astrobiology, which you've touched on. Um, Jade asked, what's the best way to get involved as astro in astrobiology, uh, which you'll have an opinion on, um, whereas Elif is talking about um, how to proceed from being a master's student. So I would definitely progress a, a lot further. Yeah. Um, so I'm interested in the community of people that are around you and how different people have arrived in the same sphere as you have. So, so astrobiology in the UK is, is kind of a really growing community. And we've got this Astrobiology Society of Britain, which is quite active. And um, we have a website um, there as well, which I um, will try and find and put in the chat. And they they have they that demonstrates all the different groups across the UK that are doing related stuff to astrobiology because it's obviously not just us. Um, and I think um, the best way to do is like we take summer students on, or you know, I think to start with it's just learning about the topics and what aspects that you want to get into, and having a you know a good understanding of one of the traditional disciplines really helps with that. But we have summer students, and the other universities have it. The Astrobiology Society of Britain has scholarships for that as well so having some kind of life and um, hands-on experience is really good and the NASA um, websites are really good for getting career advice as well um, and I think from a master's perspective it would be finding a PhD um, if you're interested in that um, in astrobiology again looking at the key groups that are involved um, but also you know there's opportunities to go into industry you know, ex, you know, we have um, Air, I have a PhD student that's actually industry and he's talking later that, in the series um, who are building the instrumentations that are going to space to do this. I mean, that's an exciting job to actually be building them. And these have kind of engineering or math backgrounds, but it's all related to astrobiology and finding that evidence of life. So there's a whole way of doing it. Um, and I think, yeah, and I think going forward, there's a lot of um, regulation work as well that's going on so even if you're not a scientist there's ways around because apparently by 2030 the UK want to have a something a huge percent you know, a big percentage of the, the space sector budget and I think the space the global space sector budget is going to be worth 30 billion pounds by 2030 so it's a big sector to be getting into so if you are and, and it and it ill you know and if you are looking you know further afield Later on, space science is an area which is growing. There's a lot of money being put into it. You know, you've all seen the, the news last week about satellites crashing. It's because there's so many up there, you know, and these are all things that we need to, to think about. Uh, yeah, Lucinda, I'll pass over to you, sorry. Yeah, thanks, I was gonna add that absolutely you are so right. The UK has been investing 
millions of billions of pounds and dollars into the huge space satellite industry that they have here in the UK. So they've also um, invested in uh, Rub One, which is mega constellation, uh, an idea to put up more satellites uh, around uh, our planet. Um, and also Launchpad, I think they're looking at seven uh, you know, launch facilities to be able to launch satellites themselves instead of relying on, I guess, um, ESA. So more private business probably. I know in the United States, private space industry, obviously like SpaceX and Boeing, um, we're definitely moving towards a space future, which is um, making it more common, more normal, more every day. I mean, I think we're, we're talking more and more about how everything is connected to space that we use today, just like having this internet available to us, the technology, mobile phones. Um, but in the field of astrobiology, definitely as well, because what are those satellites doing? They're giving us data. So again, like you mentioned, even if you're not a a scientist, there's going to be something for everyone to do. Citizen science is huge these days, and there's going to be a lot of data to go through <laughs> from all this experimentation um, that we're getting from these instruments, either landing on um, on planetary bodies or orbiting moons of other planets. Um, but to learn more about the environment around us, you know, and that's it. The, we can learn a lot from from these satellites. Give us Earth observations, and it's something you touched on previously, Lucinda. Was about planetary protection, you know, all these individual identities, you know, we need to make sure that we're working as, as, um, as one to make sure that we don't cause damage to space as well. So I think there's a lot of, I think space is gonna be one of those topics over the next 10 years, which is gonna be in the media. We've got, we've got missions to the icy moons, we've got more sample return. It's just a really exciting area um, to be in um, as well. Definitely with all these other nations getting involved. So not just the UK, of course, you know, we have, um, that are involved in all these, but now we have China, UAE um, at Mars the, this year. China's about to land on Mars for the first time. So it is definitely sort of a very, you know, exciting time. I think I heard Manish Patel, who I think is also, yeah. at the, uh, yesterday yeah. called it the golden age. Yeah, the golden age. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's later this month that China will be will be landing on Mars, which is exciting. And then, you know, I've been working in people's Africa and, e e you know, you've got Ethiopia, Nigeria, they've all got their own space agencies. So all these kind of developing countries are, are doing this. And that, again, is something really exciting. It's that global presence. It's that it's not just one agency any or two agencies. It's it's more than that now. And I think that is, is a really exciting opportunity for us. Yeah, and I do want to, I'm going to get to your questions. And I just wanted to mention this last kind of connection to astrobiology. Hello, it just landed in our back garden. We have <laughs> meteorites that we collected um, in the UK, which hadn't landed. I think we hadn't had sort of these sorts of um, this sort of impact for 30 years of, of having meteorites in the UK that we could collect. So it's, you know, it's definitely part of our current, uh, the landscape here in the UK, astrobiology looking for life um, in the solar system. So another question here um, from Alif, what are the options outside of academia for astrobiologists? So I, I touched on citizen science. Is there anything else that you can add to that? Yeah, so we, um, I have a, a space governance is a, is a huge area at the moment, which is really, really big. And um, we, um, I, I've just employed a space governance person. And this is looking at, again, the regulations around plant protection, also the satellites that you touched on. Um, there's that whole area of, of, of law that's just not been developed. You know, we can look at some of the, you know, we have the, the space treaty, which was developed back in 1969, and, and time's gone on from that. And we can look at treaties on Earth. So for example, like the Antarctica Treaty as an analog for that, but it's still, it's still, it's not, it needs to be, we still have a lot to learn going forward because that was built when we, we just had kind of two, two major um, space agencies involved. So space governance is, is, is a huge area that, that, that I can see that's gonna be coming a real issue. And um, there's opportunities, you know, we've got the UK Space Agency in the UK, you know, there's jobs, you know, ESA as well. That there's just lots of opportunities there as well. And I think there's jobs that you don't think about. You know, I work with a group that are studying climate change and they're using space data to do that. I have a project and I haven't mentioned this, whereas we are, this, this is a very bizarre way of doing, we're using space data to monitor areas where malaria could exist in Guyana. And then we're using rover technology that was built for ExoMars to detect that on the ground 
And then using microbial work, which I did on the ISS, looking at survival, is growing microbes in the community, which we could then use as a bio controlled for malaria using um, village you know, indigenous um, um, engagement. So there's a whole way there where without actually thinking about it, you are engaged in astrobiology or space. And I think that that's, that's a really exciting opportunity, I think, going forward. And I'm going to pass the next question on to Joe, but I did want to say that that's the whole idea. And I love space exploration and, and um, discovery and adventure, but it's all about really how, what are we going to learn that can help us here on earth as well, moving forward with all the issues that we have. So it's not just about what's out there. Out there is part of us. And I think that's what I'm always trying to communicate at least to as much as I can. Go ahead. And Alicinda, I think also when we, I mentioned about early earth, we can't look at, we can't study early earth because of the titanics, you know, there's not, there's not, a history, you know, we can't, um, evidence is very difficult, but we can look at Mars because it didn't have that kind of activity. So there's, there's ways and means that we can learn from there to bring it back to Earth. And I think that is something when we think about we've got to go out and find life, there's a lot of information that we can develop. And also the technologies, you know, we've mentioned the internet, we've mentioned Teflon, you know, these are all things that were developed for the space race, which are helping us on Earth as well. Got a couple of questions. Um, one is, and it's just something as I'm listening to you thinking about the marketing of space and how we talk about space in schools um, and the career opportunities. And I think often we don't talk about how adaptable it is when you have scientists who are studying space and driving technology and engineering and that um, how that floods into so many different careers and uh, opportunities here on earth. Uh, do you think that there's a, a marketing problem or something that we're not talking about properly in education and, and how can we solve that through uh, the way that we communicate about these topics? I, I think there's probably more um, people on this line that have more experience than teachers on this but you know I, I as I mentioned you know I originally wanted I originally wanted to do marine biology um, at, univers at university and I think the skills the basic skills we learn in science can be applied to so many different things and I think at school you know I found you know I'm talking a, a few years ago now it was very dry about chemistry and biology were very dry and I think if we could use some of these examples for example space and astrobiology to kind of um, teach these quick and um, these key points so I actually have an education expert in my group. And what we're trying to use is space and astrobiology as a mechanism to get some of these key STEM um, issues, um, key, key STEM um, curriculum points across using astrobiology as a mechanism to do that. And, and it's, you know, when you think about it, you know, I talked about a lot about biology at the beginning of this talk, and we could connect that, that, that might help help with some of the work that, that can be done. And that's what we've been doing in, in Africa, in, in Ethiopia, we've been using kind of astrobiology and their natural environment to teach some of these, these kind of key STEM issues and concepts through space and, and analog work. So I think that's quite, you know, there is an opportunity to do that. It just needs to be thought about. And there are resources. So I know that the universe, um, the, the Centre of Astrobiology in Edinburgh have developed teaching resources for astrobiology. We've been working with Dynamic Earth to make materials. So there is materials out there. And I think NASA have just released some in ESA. So it is something that is being considered. But I suppose it depends if teachers have time to actually do that. I think that's something that, you know, particularly at the moment they've got these core um areas that they need to teach so yeah i wanted to ask a, a, a granular question something uh, a problem with space exploration which we've touched on briefly but i'd like to hear your uh, thoughts on this is from jim uh, and it says what is the possibility of contamination from early lander missions where the cleanliness and hygiene controls were not as rigorous as they are today well Actually, the, the, the initial regulations back in the day is, is still, you know, they were really, they're really relevant. We were really careful not we didn't do that. I mean, if we look back at the Viking data, there was there was potential issues with organic contamination when we thought we had organics on the surface of Mars. But now we analysing that data, we, we find that it's not. Um, and, you know, I think this is something that we have been really careful about doing. And it's something that we are extremely concerned about going forward and um, if you look at the, there are international guidelines on this which people adhere to 
and it's very much based on the the aim of the mission so if it's looking for evidence alike they're a bit more stringent if you're landing on the planet you now we have all these regulations and basically that depends on the amount of bio burden or the amount of contamination it's allowed they're very neg negligible amounts and um, they are really strict guidelines so we're, we we do try our hardest um not to do this it's something that is is something to be considered but also that's even before they leave earth and then you know if we think about mars it's got a six month um period in space where it's being exposed to high radiation and vacuum as well so there's there's a lot of um, work that's been done in this area um, to make sure that this doesn't happen Lucinda, i'll pass over to you for any comments but also we've got lots of questions still there that you can have a look at yeah there there are a lot of great questions and one that's sort of um, touches like on the background. I'm a field as a field scientist and done lots of field work myself as a geologist. Um, Jade asks, "Where is the best place you've been for field work?" Oh, that's that's a good question. Um, I have to say, the best place I've ever been is the Dalar region in Ethiopia, which is deemed the most extreme environment on Earth, and um, it just looks amazing. It's got lots of different colors. It's and it's really extreme. It's like the, the pH is below one. We have really high temperatures, uh, but it's in the middle of this. It's the middle of this like salt desert, and it's got this little community, a village close by. Um, and it's you know, and they and it's just an amazing place to go as a scientist, but also as as somebody who's traveling. You know, you're going there to do science, and these people in these communities are are just trying to survive and they're living off the land. So it's kind of a clash of cultures. Um, and, and it is it, it's a fantastic place to go um yeah we've my group's done um field work all over the place Botswana Iceland India the US so yeah there's there's lots of analog sites out there which we can do and it's that's something as an astrobiologist um if you like traveling it is really good for that because you go to some amazing places Lucinda you've done some amazing work in in the states with analog works as well haven't you yeah, it took me out of the United States, actually, like New Zealand, where we had to be welcomed by a Maori family to stay with them. It was amazing. But the most life altering field work I've done is in the Pilbara in Australia, looking at three, have three and a half billion year old stromatolites, a very special, secure kind of a science site that I was privileged to be a part of, uh, a part of a NASA expedition. Um, and looking for you know, microbial, what would what did uh, ancient microbial life look like, and what does you know what what might we what might the rovers find on Mars? What what are they looking for? So that was just incredible, and um, yeah, nothing like being outdoors. Uh, <laughs> and, that's, and that's it. As an astrobiologist, you can have a job sitting at your desk analyzing data. You can be in the lab doing experiments, or you could be in the field or a combination of all three. So that's quite a nice, very, if you're the kind of person that likes variation in your day or in your week, it's, it's, an, it's a nice opportunity to do rather than just um, one, you know, one, kind of, one kind of data collection. I'm gonna uh, go to a question from um, John Zarnecki, who is a good oh, friend. No. Of ours. <laughs> yeah, he had his hand raised from the very beginning. I remember I mentioned oh, that. No. So his question, and he says here, from a gray haired male professor. Um, if you had to put money on which object in the solar system um, oh. would be the first to show life, would you put your money on Enceladus or Titan or oh. Mars or Venus or somewhere else? Yeah. Well, John was um, at the Open University when I joined as a PhD student. So this is a um, nice to see you, John. Um, I would say, I'm gonna put my money where I have to say Enceladus. But it's not just about buying life. To me, Enceladus or the icy moons is really exciting because you could have another genesis for life. Because when we look at the solar system, if, if we did find life on Mars, we'd have to prove that it's indigenous to, to Mars, that it hasn't just been transferred through processes on meteorites, etc., from Earth. Whereas if we found life in the subsurface of Enceladus, it's completely closed off from anywhere else. So it would be a single genesis. And we know there's hydrothermic systems in the bottom of Enceladus. So potentially we could, they could form some of the biomolecules for life. And finally, some of the modeling that we've done in our group has demonstrated that the composition of the oceans could actually be conducive to life. So that's where I'm putting my, my money is on Enceladus. Um, that, that's where I'd, I'd, I'd make the decision to go. <laughs> There you have it, John, from the director of Astrobiology. <laughs> Joe, any questions from you? 
Yeah, you were talking about meteorites and um, potentially life on, on those. Uh, I've got a couple of questions that I'm going to merge together, talking about uh, microbes in space, how they can exist there, where there might be exposure over the six month journey you were talking about from Mars uh, back to Earth or vice versa. Um, and also the other one was about, yeah, microbial life being transferred um, other than through human intervention. Okay, so um, there's been a lot of work that's looked at microbial survival in space. So there was a long term experiment um, about 10 years ago where they, they put microbes in space for six years and looked at the impact of the space environment, low Earth orbit on, on them. Um, also, we use the International Space Station to do a lot of this work. Um, we know that if they're not protected, so there's no filters on them, that the microbes that we've sent into space just can't survive. But what you do get is you can still pick up some remnants of them through the biosignature detection. And that's why we do it, um, because we can um, we can look for um, so we can look at how biosignatures degrade over time. So there's, there has been a lot of work. I think, as I mentioned before, probably over a thousand species of microbes have been sent up into space over the over the the time period. Um, because we, we, we kind of have these big international projects where we do that. So there's, a, there, there, there's that work. And then the question about transfer of microbes. Yeah, this is something, this whole concept of lithopanspermia is that microbes, you know, we know that meteorites exist and that we have these, these um, impacts which, which could produce this material and potentially could be transferred. Now, there's an experiment called the stone experiment where we simulated a massive stone flowing through the atmosphere of Earth and looked at if microbes can survive. Um, they can't really survive on the outward side of, of, of it, but there's nothing that's saying if they were embedded in the meteorite or, or, or in the rock itself that they couldn't survive. So that is something that, you know, that is a potential. Um, yeah, this kind of works all ongoing at the moment, and it's quite topical um, conversation to have not just from a scientific perspective, but also from the planetary protection perspective, when we're looking at bio burden and numbers and how, how, um, what, how stringent we need to be going forward. Do you think there's a potential for our understanding of, um, of microbes and uh, viruses and all of these things that we're not, that we, we feel like we've kind of ticked off, we've, we've done pretty well, we're, biology is pretty well in, embedded, but there might be developments to understand them better in a, in a new context in different environments. Yeah, I think that there is, there's, you know, there's lots of work looking at that actually not outside the International Space Station, but inside looking at um, microgravity and the effect of microbes on microgravity that we couldn't do on Earth as well. Um, and also there's a, a whole area of microbiology, which is looking at if we could use microbes for in situ resource utilization. So Lucinda, we talked about human exploration. One option for this would be that we'd use microbes to kind of biomine and um, resources so we, that we wouldn't need to take with us. Um, there's this whole idea um, called, um, it's like a biological loop where it basically is um, a system um, that they kind of want to develop for space travel and potentially um, for settlements is that, you know, they take human waste and they process it with microbes and they kind of have this whole, you know, breakdown of produce and then they can, you know, this kind of this whole idea of basically using microbiology again. So, you know, I think going for, you know, yes, we need to learn about microbes for ad adaptation and origins of life and the fundamentals, but also going forward, microbiology in astrobiology has huge applications for these future missions and um, these potential human missions that we're looking at in the future. Excellent. That's really great to know. And absolutely, so many things get recycled on the International Space Station. You know, we need microbes. I think they also just recently found fungus, which I'm a huge fan of fungus because obviously you, you can eat some of them, you can yeah. build with some of them. <laughs> I mean, these are things that we kind of go, ooh, we don't want to know, you know, but I think we really need to learn more about and educate ourselves on their importance in, you know, the evolution of life and in keeping us also as a species on this planet too. Um, so Joe, do you mind if I jump to something on the ISS? Great. Please. Okay, so uh, someone from our YouTube channel, thank you, Joe, for alerting me that there are questions on YouTube. Most of them I think we've answered, um, but a couple of them, one here in Zoom and one on YouTube, so asks, uh, what's the significance of the unique bacteria recently identified on the International Space Station? I don't know if you have heard of that. I, I didn't realize that. And then another question is asking about uh, a carbon-13 isotopic signature of methane. 
um, on Mars, uh, does it indicate a possible biogenic origin? Yeah, so the, we'll start with the methane one. Um, this um, is an area of conversation because we don't know what the atmospheric composition of Mars is. It, it is this is quite a complex one, which is kind of an ongoing discussion. Um, I'm not an expert in isotopes, but it is it is something that's being considered. But what we have with the, the TGO, which is now part of the ExoMars mission, which is orbiting around Mars, is what the idea was when they built that, was that they would use, they would be able to measure the methane to ethane ratio as a as a as a proxy for, for, for microbial life potentially. So that's something that you know they are looking at. The, the makeup of the methane and the ratios it with other compounds to see if it is a biotic, biogenic origin. Um, but that's something that is ongoing. The International Space Station's work, this is the isolate that was from isolated inside the International Space Station. Is this the one we're talking about? He didn't specify this person, sorry, this person did not specify DC bat, bass. Okay. Um, just recently identified on the ISS. It didn't say inside or out. Um, I haven't red one of being isolated on the outside I feel I need to go and read that paper I, I apologize there um because I know that the uh, uh, JP uh, I know in the states what they're doing is that they're developing a way of sampling the outside of the International Space Station so this could be linked to that work that they're doing um but for you know inside the micro inside the ISS yes that I mean that doesn't really surprise me because you've got all your human microbes that you take up and um yeah I I think it's something that we just need to see how, what it is, how it's adapted to it. And if there is something of interest there, I mean, there's been a lot of studies how looking into how the human um, biota is influenced by um, on the ISS. So they've done an experiment with twins. One went up, one stayed at home and how that affected the, 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 the microbiome, which I think is a really interesting study. So I think there's a lot we can learn on the fact, the effects of that on, um, on, on, on that work. Yeah, those are the Kelly twins, I believe. And I, I think I read his book when he came back. Um, oh, um, did you? <laughs> yeah, don't ask me any questions for I don't remember how to go back and read it. <laughs> Joe, I have a burning question, but I'm gonna hand it back to you if you give me some time at the end, if there's anything you wanted to ask. You can definitely go now. Okay, great. So we are wrapping up here. We're almost at uh, one o'clock. It's been amazing with you. And thank you to, for everyone to all your for all your questions. And um, Jade, thank you so much. You've been asking lots of really questions. Hopefully you're a future biologist, astrobiologist, or you're already one. Um, but Jade brings up the um, study uh, of exoplanets. And I think it, even, you know, we can continue to look for exoplanets even under this pandemic. So I think this year in 2021, we have over 4,000 confirmed um, exoplanets uh, that we can see um, from, from here, from Earth, that we can study, because it's such a huge, vast sky. We can only look at small parts of it. So that's just in the small parts that we've looked at. So what do you think about the future of astrobiology with this, with this finding of exoplanets? I think the, the exoplanet area is a really interesting area and it's going to be really exciting coming forward. I think um, as, as my work, you know, I've traditionally focused on the solar system, but I've been having these conversations with more people and the way that the field's going, I think exoplanets is going to be something to keep your eye on in the future. And this is where astronomy fits in, isn't it? This is, a, we've talked about biology and geology, but this is something where as an astronomer, you could be, be doing some key work um, for looking at exoplanets and helping to identify some of these planets. So yeah, I think this is going to be a really hot topic um, going forward over the next, um, I think, the next five to 10 years. It's, it's gonna keep us very busy actually. And there's so much data coming back from these incredible instruments in, that we have built to put in space, not let alone landing on surfaces of some of these bodies or orbiting them. Um, so, and, and now we're looking beyond our solar system and with this, a number this large, there's gonna be a lot of work to do. So, um, I think that's it for us. Joe, we're already past one o'clock. That went by so fast. And uh, <laughs> Professor uh, Ols Olson Francis, I always call you Karen, so I don't. <laughs> um, but just thank you so much for being with us. I hope you enjoyed this. Um, oh, we promised to show the video. What should we do, Joe? If we've got time, I think let's show the video or we can post the link on everywhere if it, if it doesn't quite work out. Try to try and share it. Karen. How's your time, okay. Professor? Oh, she's doing it, okay. Perfect. Oh.
Have you ever looked up at the stars and wondered, are we alone? It's one of those fundamental questions that humans have thought about for thousands of years, and the search for that answer is what drives the field of astrobiology. Astrobiology is the study of life in our universe, and it brings together lots of different types of science, such as biology, chemistry, physics, geology, and astronomy. Astrobiologists want to find out how life began, how it evolved, and where in the universe we might find it. The best example conditions to that of Earth when life evolved here. We can see evidence of dried up river channels and lakes on Mars, so maybe Mars could have supported life. How would we tell that there was life there? We could look for footprints from little green aliens, but that would be unlikely. Astrobiologists think that life elsewhere in the universe is probably microscopic, so how would you detect these microscopic life forms? You could look for things that the microbes have left behind. Astrobiologists call these biosignatures. There is a complication though. Life exists pretty much everywhere on Earth, including in some of the harshest environments. We find microscopic life at the bottom of the oceans, inside glaciers, in the deserts, even high up in the atmosphere. The organisms that can survive these extreme conditions are called extremophiles. Different extremophiles can tolerate extremes of pressure, temperature, radiation, salinity, acidity, or can live without sunlight or oxygen. There are places with these conditions on Earth similar to those you might find elsewhere in the universe. So, astrobiologists use these analog sites to understand if and how organisms live in these environments. But that just covers life as we know it. What about extraterrestrial life? No, I'm not talking about those little green things again. 